From Daily Trust News Center, this is News Hour. On News Hour tonight, APC aspirants face screening panel in Abuja ahead of party presidential primary. Peter Obi emerges Labour Party presidential candidate after defection from PDP. Classmate of Vice President Oshibaju speaks in captivity as terrorists release new video. On the foreign scene, 16 bodies recovered from wreckage of Nepal plane. Hello and welcome to News Hour on Trust TV. I am Eugenia Abu. The national leader of the All Progressives Congress, APC, and presidential aspirant, Ashwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu, and 10 other presidential aspirants, Monday appeared before the party's screening panel. Jigawa State Governor Badaru Abubakar was the first to appear before the panel, which is sitting at the Transco Hilton Hotel Abuja. Twelve other candidates are expected to be screened on Tuesday. A former national chairman of the party, John Odige Oyegun, is chairing the screening committee. According to a list released by the party earlier, a total of 23 presidential aspirants are expected to participate in the screening exercise. In the meantime, the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, Atiku Abubakar, Monday met with River State Governor Nyesom Wike in Abuja. Atiku defeated Wike and other presidential aspirants in the party to pick the party's presidential ticket on Saturday. Atiku polled 371 votes to defeat Wike, who got 237 votes at the PDP presidential primary held at Moshud Abiola Stadium, Abuja, on Saturday. The meeting, it was gathered, was to mend fences between the two leaders ahead of the 2023 presidential elections. Even though details of the meeting remain sketchy, it was also learned that Governor Ayodele, Governor Ayodele Fayoshi of Ikiti State, amongst other PDP chieftains, was present at the meeting. Former Governor of Anambra State, Peter Obi, has emerged presidential flag bearer of Labour Party. He emerged with 98 votes at the exercise which took place in Asaba, Delta State. Here's that report. Consistent with its desire to ensure only competent and credible candidates are supported to run for Nigeria's presidency ahead of the 2023 elections, Northern Broadcast Media Owners Association Monday engaged one of the All Progressives Congress APC presidential aspirants, Tian Jack Rich, on his blueprint towards addressing the myriads of challenges undermining the Northern region in particular and the nation in general. Trust TV's Shafiu Suleiman now reports. Jack is among the 23 aspirants contesting for the presidential ticket of the ruling party. He is one of the youngest aspirants and not amongst the regular faces in Nigeria's politics. We believe for any aspirant to really get into the hearts and mind of northerners, he must address the issues of concern to them. Nigerians must know what is it that you're offering. We cannot just say, uh, hear people say, oh, I'll solve the insecurity problem. No timeline, no strategy. But he said he has a blueprint to address contemporary and existential challenges plaguing the nation. When asked, how can you address the challenges of collapsed industrial base of the region once harboring clusters of industries employing thousands of people? Jack responds thus. The key thing is to develop our economy to reduce the inflation. We must look at the low hanging fruit. Oil and gas is this low hanging fruit. We're consuming oil and gas product, we're importing it. For us to consume, we import. We produce, deplete our reserve, burn in the gas, we import gas. We produce, and then a lot of the crude gets stolen because the value chain, you know, you know, needs to be properly managed. Northern media owners ask his ideas regarding the ravaging insecurity, pervasive corruption in the out of school children. I want to be able to have the opportunity to have access to developing what we have through a strategic collaboration and give it to the people. We have an enormous amount of wealth that we don't need to beg for bread. No one Nigerian should be hungry. No one Nigerian should be struggling to go to school. If you go to some departments, I'm sorry to say this, 
you will have to, the day you put in your document for any proposal, somebody needs to take it to another desk, another piece it to another desk. All through that value chain is an exposure. But if it's technologically enabled, all you need to do, you use the tool of uh, technology and then you knock off all those bureaucratic bottlenecks and then it's addressed right on the spot. Jack Rich believes Nigeria can transcend beyond a billion dollar economy to a trillion naira superpower Africa needs to unlock its potentials. The engagement with other aspirants continues. Shapiro Suleiman, Trust TV News, Abuja. National Publicity Secretary of the Pan Niger Delta Forum, PANDEF, Ebenezer Adurukia, says the emergence of former Vice President Atiku Abubakar as a presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party is an affront to the people of southern Nigeria. Speaking on Trust TV's breakfast show, Daybreak, on Monday, Adurukia said based on the principle of zoning established in the country's political system since 1979, the South should be allowed to clinch the ticket. However, media aid to the presidential candidate disagreed with the position of the group. On principle, we felt that after eight years of a Northern presidency under Muhammadu Buhari, it was fair and proper that power should rotate to southern Nigeria based on the principle of rotation that has been established in our, in our political system over the years since 1979. And so what has happened, what the PDP has done uh, is, is, an, is an affront on, on the people of southern Nigeria. That's, that's how we see it. But beyond that, we, we think that it was a predetermined outcome. It was programmed that Atiku will win, and we knew that long ago, as far back as November last year. And that's why we insisted on, on, on zoning. And if, in fact, it was the reason why the PDP uh, jettisoned its, its principle of zoning and decided to leave the presidential ticket open for every Nigerian because they knew and they wanted Atiku Abubakar to be their presidential candidate for reasons that are untenable. It, it is not that it's only Atiku Abubakar or a Northern candidate that can give the PDP victory in the 2023 elections. That, that, that assumption is completely um, not true. Uh, no, Southerners had, had won elections for the PDP before now. Obasanjo is not from the North. Good luck. Jonathan is not from the North. So the assumption and reflections and thoughts that it's only a Northerner that can win an election for PDP in 2023 is completely untrue. It's unfair to the people of southern Nigeria, and we are rejecting the candidacy of Atiku Abubakar. And we are going to mobilize our people. I think what has counted for Atiku Abubakar at this historic time is the fact that the PDP as a party is tired of being in the opposition. They want to win an election. If you don't win an election, there will be nothing to share. And so it has become imperative that the party looks at, you know, the prospects. Prominent lieutenants of President Muhammadu Buhari have contested and lost the recently concluded governorship and National Assembly primary elections conducted by the ruling All Progressives Congress APC across the country. It may be an indication of the president's personal political beliefs which hinder him from manipulating the political process to favor his associate. Koinde Amodu looks at the political actors who could not leverage on their relationship with the president to win other primaries in the states. There is some unrest in the Buhari political circle. Those that were seen to have filial relations with the president have found themselves falling far short of the mark at the recently concluded APC governorship and National Assembly primaries. Fatuhu Muhammad, his nephew, Turad Sani Shaban, his son-in-law, and Sani Shaban, from a member of the House of Representatives, and the president's in-law all lost out at the primaries. Even some of his very visible aides did not fare better. Bashir Ahmad, personal assistant to the president on new media, Ahmad Rufai Zakari, special advisor to the president of, on infrastructure, and Ismail Buba Ahmed, Buhari's SSA on social investments, all crashed at the primaries. Close associates, all their children, were also caught up in the decimation. Farouk Adamu Aliu, a key ally of Buhari since the ANPP days, and Folajimi, son of Information and Culture Minister Lai Mohammed, also fell short when it mattered most. Observers say President Buhari does not manipulate the system, 
and obviously did not put in a word for them. It might mean that the actors may not have had as much influence on the president as Nigerians were made to believe. But there's another school that hints that the failures of members of the president's political clan may be as a result of many Nigerians suffering from Buhari fatigue. It could mean that unlike 2015 and 2019, when many political players were swept into office because of the president's towering image, aligning with him this time around may be a political risk. The word on the streets is that Nigerians are now wiser. Kende Amudu, Trust TV News, Abuja. We return now to the story we couldn't bring you earlier. We told you that Governor of Anambra State, Peter Obi, has emerged presidential flag bearer of the Labour Party. He emerged with 98 votes at the exercise which took place in Asaba, Delta State. Here's that report. The exercise commenced with enthusiastic delegates ready to cast their votes. Prior to the exercise proper, stakeholders of the party take turns to stress the need for change from the usual PDP and APC-led federal government. Crisis of unemployment, crisis of poverty, crisis of inflation, crisis of tribalism and democracy. The list is endless. Labour Party have therefore decided to make this platform an alternative platform that will rescue the country. We must identify the topic candidates for this very election. Please, vote for the presidential candidate of the Labour Party must be somebody with record. We must be ready to capture all the participants states of the Federation. Three presidential contestants made P2B's emergence easier as they stepped down from the race, leaving the ex-governor a sole aspirant. The purpose of this election and for us to move forward our party and to move forward this nation, I will step down for Peter Obi. At the end, Peter Obi emerged winner with a promise to rebuild the country. I will satisfy all the requirements and with the highest good I have put my name to Sman Aliu, Chairman of the Electoral Committee, hereby declare Peter Obi as the flag bearer. Away from politics now, attackers of the Abuja Kaduna train have released more videos showing kidnapped passengers appealing for help. In the latest series of videos sent by the terrorist group, a woman who identified herself as Gladys put a direct call to the Nigerian Vice President, Yemi Oshibaju, whom she said was her classmate in law school from 1978 to 1979. Trust TV's Nana Mohammed tells us more. Standing beside the kidnapped victims, the marked terrorist with AK-47 ordered his captives to speak. In a frantic and desperate attempt to draw the attention of the Nigerian federal government, the passengers said they were kept in horrible conditions. Gladys, a classmate of the Nigerian vice president, Professor Yemi Osibajo, tearfully appealed to the VP and the immediate past Nigerian minister of transport, Rotimi Amechi, to come to their rescue. I'm appealing particularly to Professor Yemi Oshibanjo, who was my classmate, 78-79 law school. You are a grandfather, you are a father. Come to our aid, because we've been here for 62 days. I have a son who is a sickler, and I don't know his condition. I'm pleading that the federal government and Amechi, who is the minister for, for, for transportation, should come to our assistance. 
Mariam Abubakar, who appeared in the previous video, told Nigerians and the government that two of her children are sick and are in need of medical attention. We've been here for 62 days in an unfavorable, uh, inhabitable condition, unimaginable. We've been sick. In fact, my one of my sons, two of them are even sick at the moment with no medical supply. So we're, ple we're pleading with you to please come to our aid. Sadiq Abdullahi, the eldest son of Ango Abdullahi, who also appeared in the third video, said most of the people in captivity are sick and pleaded for governments to come to their rescue. We are appealing to the federal government to once again uh, come to our aid. Uh, we've been here for 62 days. Most of us here are sick mm -hmm. and we are not in good condition and uh, every day the situation gets deteriorating. The second video was sent on 26th of March 2022 with a threat by the terrorists to start executing their victims if governments fail to meet their demand. A Pakistani national called the attention of international organizations and his government to intervene. I'm a foreign national, Pakistani national. So we were abducted on 28th March uh, from the Abuja Kaduna train and uh, we are here, uh, we are 62 people and uh, the conditions are not very good. So we are appealing to the government of Pakistan and government of Nigeria and to the whole world international community so that they can help us. The consistent calls and direct pleas to important and influential people may not be unrelated to the slow response by the government to secure the release of some of the 62 passengers still in captivity. There have been persistent calls to draw the government's attention whether or not the government had their calls, time is of the essence to rescue the kidnapped train passengers. Nan Muhammad, Trust TV News, Abuja. Amid heavy security, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, has arraigned the presidential hopeful and former governor of Imo State, Rochas Okorocha, before a federal high court in Abuja. Okorocha, who currently represents Imo West Senatorial District in the National Assembly, was arraigned before Justice Inyang Ekwa on Monday in the nation's capital for alleged fraud to the tune of 2.9 billion naira. Madia Umar now reports. The alleged fraud was said to have been perpetrated by Okorocha and one Anim Iyerere through private companies between 2014 and 2016 when he held sway as governor of Imo State. The All Progressives Congress APC presidential aspirant was ported in a pensive mode, ready to give his plea against the charges in court. Some of his family members and political associates were also in court ahead of his arrival. Though he pleaded not guilty and denied all charges, Okorota has, however, engaged the services of four senior advocates of Nigeria, led by Oke Amechi. Outside the court, representatives of the EFCC declined to address the press as they left the court with Okorocha, who will be in their custody till his bill application hearing on the 31st of May 2022. Lead counsel to the defendant, Oke Amechi, who said the charge against his client was filed in January, however, alleged that Okorocha was not served. We have applied for bail because he's entitled to bail. If he's served, and he didn't appear, that will, the court will issue a warrant for his service, but he was not served. And they did not even take advantage of the provision of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act, which says if you can't find the defendant, you file a motion for substance service, the court will give you leave and put it at his house. They didn't do that. Uh, we don't want to suspect their motive for what they did, particularly choosing the day of the screening. So, but when we come tomorrow, I don't want to go deep into it, because the issues are before the court now. After Okorocha pleaded not guilty in the courtroom today, counsel to Nigeria's anti-graft agency, that's the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, Balaho Latona, did ask for an adjournment so he could assemble all the 15 witnesses that would testify against Okorocha. He said this adjournment is necessary because some of the witnesses do not live in the court jurisdiction and he needs more time at least till the 1st of June. But Justice Iyang Echo said that all bail application and all opposition have to be filed within time. That is on the 31st of May. Therefore, the bail application for Rochas Okrocha will be heard on the 31st of May. 
Martia Umar, Trust TV News Abuja. Police on Monday said gunmen have attacked the state-owned Anambra Broadcasting Service. The police public relations officer in the state, Ikenga Tochuku, confirmed the early morning attack in a statement in Oka, the state capital. He revealed that the incident occurred at about 4.30 in the morning at Awada, in a Demili North local government area of the state. Monday's incident is the latest in the series of attacks carried out recently by armed men despite the amnesty offered by the government to criminals terrorizing the state. While the indigenous people of Biafra, IPOB, has been linked to most of the attacks in the state, the secessionist group has repeatedly insisted that it had no hand in the violence. Barely a month after the explosion that killed some people at a beer parlor in Kaba, Kogi State, a similar incident has been recorded in the town. A place called Obafemi Bar at Okepadi Axis of Kaba was hit on Sunday night. The cause of the incident and the nature of the explosion is yet to be fully established. But the Kogi State Police Command's public, police public relations officer, SP William Ayer, confirmed the incident, saying no casualty was recorded. Previously, it was filed that on May 11th, explosion rocked a beer parlor at Leu Junction, stealing Kaba, killing two people. The police had attributed the incident to a gas cylinder, but the victim's family members said it was a bomb explosion. A similar attack was also recorded in Taraba State last month. The Islamic State in West African province later claimed responsibility. You're watching Trust TV News Hour. Coming up after the break, physically challenged person takes shoemaking business to another level. Do stay with us. Residents of the Federal Capital Territory are hereby allotted to the activities of scavengers, also known as Babambula, which security agencies have identified as a high-level security threat to not only the residents, but also to our infrastructure as they perpetrate petty stealing and acts of vandalism on public utilities. More so, they are drug peddlers, serve as spies to terrorist elements, and are ready-made tools for the public disturbances during which they attack people with dangerous weapons. The Federal Capital Territory Administration, therefore, reiterate that the ban on scavengers aka Bababula operating within the federal capital city is still in force. These miscreants are advised to stay off the streets of the federal capital city for their own good as defaulters will be apprehended and prosecuted, including parents of underage children involved in these practices. Relevant agencies are carrying out enforcement of this ban as stipulated. Be law abiding always. Let's together build the FCT of our dreams. Management and AMSA.
Welcome back. If you are just joining us, you're watching News Hour on Trust TV. Another look at our top stories. APC as parents face screening panel in Abuja ahead of party presidential primary. Peter Obi emerges Labour Party presidential candidate after defection from PDP. Nigeria Center for Disease Control on Sunday said 66 suspected cases of monkeypox had been reported in the country between January 1st and May the 29th. According to the agency, 21 of the suspected cases were confirmed in nine states, while one death was recorded in a 40-year-old man with renal comorbidity and on immune suppressive drugs. The NCDC said it has activated the National Multisectoral Emergency Operations Center at level two to continue to coordinate ongoing response activities. The National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control has approved two herbal drugs for COVID-19 clinical trials. NAFDAC Director General Professor Mujishola Adeye in a statement Sunday said three herbal formulations were approved for clinical trial studies during the COVID-19 pandemic. She said while two studies had commenced, including the IHP Detox Tea, the third clinical trial study is yet to start. Meanwhile, Adeyeye denounced the claims of efficacy of IHP detox tea for the cure of COVID-19 patients purportedly made by the Chief Executive Officer of Bioresources Development and Conservation Program, Professor Morris Iwu, in a national daily. She said it is worrisome that such unguarded statement is made without the stated fact that no product can be approved by NAFDAQ without satisfactory clinical evidence. In the meantime, women and teenage girls in Josh, the Plateau State Capital, have been sensitized on the need to adopt the best hygiene measure during their menstrual period. The sensitization program was part of an event which took place at the Yunus Foundation School, Joss, with female parents and schoolgirls from different communities to the Joss City Centre as participants. Here's that report. A representative of the organizers, Aishat Abdul Hamid, said the program was to draw the attention of the female parents to their responsibility of educating their female children the best way to manage their first time menstrual experience. Basically, this program is about uh, enlightening the young girls and women around the block on how to maintain their menstrual activities. Amina Ishak Ibrahim, a facilitator at the event, lamented almost zero availability of menstrual education in northern Nigeria, especially among Hausa parents, and called for attitudinal change. One of my biggest takeaways will be the fact that we are able to educate young girls on how to take care of themselves during period. I think in our northern, in the northern society, this is one of the things that we do not discuss even within the home setting. So creating a safe space for young girls to actually discuss this within themselves and um, with other people who are more enlightened than them is, is quite amazing, honestly. Some of the participants appreciated the foundation for the program saying the lesson they have learned will help them better manage challenges that comes with their cycles. Orientation about uh, personal hygiene administration, like how we are going to um, help ourselves for everything that comes over to us that we didn't know, it. we didn't know anything about it. We want to see how we can take care of ourselves when we are menstruation, and that is important for us. The Federal Capital Territory Administration, FCTA, on Monday in Abuja demolished scavengers' camp and illegal markets at Lugwe on Namdi Azikiwe International Airport Road. The Senior Special Assistant on Monitoring, Inspection and Enforcement to the FCT Minister, Ikaro Ata, who led the exercise, said the activities of scavengers and illegal markets constitute a nuisance to the area. He explained that Lugwe Federal Housing Authority Estate Junction, Phase 1 and 2, Lugwe by Berger Yard are very sensitive areas that need to meet up with the best standards. Atta, who said illegal acts would not be allowed to continue in the areas, noted that the FCT Minister Mohamed Bello, after inspecting the area with a task force team, 
directed the team to ensure that sanity was maintained in the area. Atta said that many of the demolished illegal shanties or suspected criminal hideouts were hoodlums, smoke marijuana and other illicit drugs freely. Bauchi State Governor Bala Mohammed has emphasized the need for peaceful coexistence among people in the state. The governor stated this during an on-the-spot visit and assessment of the damage caused by the recent unrest in Yelwa community. Adamu Imam has details. Governor Mohammed, who visited the warring communities of Lukshi and Ongwan Akani, all in Yelwa area, a suburb from Bauchi Metropolis, assured that the state government will bear the cost of damage recorded and call for peace from both parties. We will make sure justice is done to whoever perpetuates this. And as an interim measure, we will be sending SEMA to take valuation of the losses incurred here. As a government, we will take responsibility. I learned that one of my brothers who has put his farm produce, the commissioner told me everything is banned. Definitely we will replace it. Please take care and be a policeman. It is not this policeman that will work for us. Each and every one of you is a policeman. Earlier, the state commissioner of police who told the governor that the crisis was not religious, but a result of misunderstanding between the youth in the area, which led to the loss of lives and properties, promised to take drastic measures to avoid reoccurrence. Everybody must please live in accordance to the law. I have sounded that warning yesterday. Today again, I'm taking this privilege with the permission of His Excellency that we are not going to condone any form of indiscipline in terms of taking the law into your hands. Nobody will be allowed to do that. Trust TV also got the thought of some residents of the communities on the 24 hours curfew imposed in Yalwa area. By living in peace, we get to develop ourselves. By living in peace, we get to move on and advance. We've seen the side effects of living in crises and problems. We've seen how people have lost their houses, innocent people. We've seen how people have lost their lives. We've seen how people have lost their resources, their farm resources and all of, and all of that. So I would want to call on our brothers, be it Muslims and Christians, let's stay together, let's collectively live as one to one another. We are not in our mood the way that we're supposed to be because of this, which is very hardship way that we found ourselves in it. But Alhamdulillah, since when we see the governor himself, the visit was here, we really appreciate and we agree that all was the promise to us, maybe, maybe we had it in each other. Bala also assured the community that very soon the government will establish a new police station in the area to help restore law and order. Adam Imam, Trust TV News, Bauchi. Traders at the timber shed of the popular Day Day Building Materials Market and its adjoining markets in the Abuja Municipal Area Council that was shut following crisis which erupted at the market on the 18th of May 2022 have resumed business activities. This follows the reopening of the market by the FCT Minister Mohammed Musabello on Friday the 27th of May 2022, some nine days after the clash between motorcycle riders and traders which left goods worth millions damaged and lives lost. Trust TV's Aisha Salihu visited the market on a busy Monday and filed in this report. This is the timber shade access of the popular Day Day International Market, a market that was ravaged by fire incident just a couple of days ago, where the, due to the clash between the Okado riders and the traders in this market, although the FCTA uh, uh, shut down this market, just so peace and uh, sanity can be restored. This market, once filled with warehouses with varieties of timber products, is gradually returning to how it used to be following the restoration of normalcy after the motorcycle riders and traders clash. Chibu Zoykasi, chairman of the Timber Traders Association of the Market, says although losses have been recorded, they are nevertheless thankful for the reopening of the market. As so far, the estimates we have. Uh collected some are still bringing, uh, it's, it's over one billion. As I, the last we calculated, we've gotten about 1.5 billion, and some other people are still bringing their own this money. The minister has uh, opened the market, people are happy, and uh, 
they have uh, resumed their normal businesses. And as you can see, the market is lively. The business is booming. Duru Amadike, the chief security officer of the market and one of the victims of the clash, is gradually settling in. He has been forced to rebuild while recounting his losses. Well, it's one of those things I can't keep to a man. I cannot ask God why. It has happened, it has happened. By grace of God, we will survive it. We have no catch at hand, but we are trying to manage mm. the route we have at hand mm. to know whether we can also appreciate again. Officials at the market said they had put in safety measures to arrest possible incidents and other security breaches and called on the FCT minister to assist in that regard. We need external uh, assistance in the security. The government should help us provide more. He urged all to be law-abiding for a peaceful and successful conduct of business moving forward. Repairs and reconstruction are ongoing in the market and businesses, according to some of the traders here, are gradually picking up. Although the officials of the market are in talks with the authority to ensure that there is proper security and other measures implemented to avert a similar incident occurring in future time. Aisha Salihu, Trust TV News, Abuja. You're watching News Hour on Trust TV. We will be back after the break. Stay. Daily, we bring you updates around politics. People like you who are very young, you have no future. Anybody now who is 30 years, if what is happening to the continues, by the time you are 60, you will have no country. The DPO of a particular unit does not have to wait until the commissioner tells him what to do within his jurisdiction. We have political parties on the ground. Some of them have been there for years. Mm. But they themselves, in their own sober moments, mm. they know that this country is not the one they are expecting to run. Policy and governance. Are you saying the NBS what? is lying? I'm saying to you very clearly mm. that the NBS has a serious problem with mm. accurate data till today. The fifth assembly, as well as the seventh assembly, uh, their own attempt were unproductive. Emergence of the Taliban has simply emboldened terror groups globally. There is a lot of attention with regards to security developments in Nigeria. On daily politics, we interrogate issues, holding the actors to account, bearing in mind all the sides. We heard that in some places now, people have to go and pay tax, not to the local government, not to the state to criminals. Nobody can come to your house and kidnap you without information. If this country is bleeding, it is bleeding because we have failed to educate our young. This is Trust TV. You're watching News Hour. Thank you for rejoining us. 
There seems to be no end to the upheavals that characterize the just concluded primaries of the All Progressives Congress, APC, in Tarabo State. This was clearly demonstrated on Sunday when aggrieved aspirants for the position of the State House of Assembly kicked against the entire exercise. The aspirants, who claimed that the primaries did not take place in any of their constituencies, urged the National Secretariat of the party to, as a matter of urgency, do the needful in order to save the party from collapse in the state. The aspirants, who converged at the party's state secretariat, told journalists that the committee assigned with the responsibility of conducting the exercise was not cited in the state. and met with the state's leadership of the party. Today, we met with all the uh, aspirants of the party and the state working committee, and have agreed on way, modalities for the conduct of the primaries. What I have seen is that um, the committee have arrived, and they have did all the necessary things. First thing, they visited the CP, and went to the and they call us the stakeholders and they give us privilege to choose what uh, what mode of the election or what mode of the primaries that we uh, want uh, we are here to address this the press and to tell the whole world concerning the issue of the worrisome issue bedeviling our party and entirely these are uh, worrisome issue may likely affect the outcome of the 2023 come 2023 general election However, we were meant to understand that uh, there is a committee set up by the National Working Committee. But the National Working Committee should know that election was not conducted. If they had sent a committee, the committee has not come down to Taraba. And from Taraba to Adamawa State, where a physically challenged man in Yola, the Adamawa state capital, Ibrahim Idris, has taken to shoe and bags making in an effort to take himself off street begging. Ibrahim Idris is also optimistic that with the necessary support from appropriate quarters, many in similar conditions with him will quit street begging and engage in profitable ventures. Salis Lawan from Iola has details. <laughs> He was a street beggar, but for more than seven years, he has not been seen on the street, waiting for handouts from people. Instead, he has become the breadwinner of his family. Ibrahim Idris is now a shoemaker, a business that, according to him, transformed his life. Despite transforming his life, Ibrahim Idris was quick to point out some challenges affecting the business. Sana ache the Mukadogara de Shi. Sana ache. I learned this business 10 years ago. The shoemaking in it alone, I feed my family and as well meet up their daily needs. America Kaida, Nakoya, Mawasumuta, Nida Dama, Aiki, Atiki. So they were. A truly inspiring story there. Time now to join Chair Macau Castle for business news. The Nigerian Customs Service says it has so far generated about 2 billion naira from the revalidation of documents of private aircraft across the country. The service had in June 2021 threatened to detain private aircraft whose owners are yet to validate their documentation in line with the federal government's revalidation policy. It gave private aircraft owners 30 days to comply with the directive, failure of which their aircraft would be grounded by the service. In an exclusive interview with Daily Trust, the NCS Public Relations Officer, Timi Bomodi, said the service has realized about 2 billion naira from the exercise. Bomodi explained that the service deemed it necessary to cancel the deadline issued as a result of the willingness of private aircraft owners to comply with the directive. The Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Adini Adebayo, on Sunday inaugurated a committee to look into the issue of rejection of Nigeria's agro-produce 
in the international market. The committee reaches members from the ministry and some parastatals of the ministry and Ministry of Agriculture is headed by the Director, Commodities and Export Department, Suleiman Audu. It is charged with the responsibility of identifying the major causes of the rejection of the agro-produce and prefer appropriate recommendations. Inaugurating the committee, the minister in a statement by his special assistant on media, Ifedayo Shayo, said the federal government places emphasis on the promotion of non-oil commodity exports, which has led to farmers and product aggregators partnering to explore the export market for their products. The minister gave the committee six weeks to submit its report. And finally, on the stock market, at the end of the first weekday of trading on the Nigerian Stock Exchange, a total of 227,610,015 shares in 4,586 deals, corresponding to a market value of 2.9 trillion naira, were traded. Compared with the previous trading day of Friday, Monday's data shows 9% improvement in volume, 46% decline in turnover, and 6% decline in deals. The current market capitalization of the Nigerian Stock Exchange is 29 trillion naira. In the aggregate, 109 listed equities participated in trading, ending with 22 gainers and 21 losers. The benchmark all share index dropped 313.16 points to close at 53,772.14, representing a one week gain of 1.63% and an overall year-to-date gain of 25.88%. And that's it on Business News. Underway from Nigeria, Nepali rescuers on Monday retrieved 16 bodies from the mangled wreckage of a passenger plane strewn across a mountainside that crashed in the Himalayas with 22 people on board. Air traffic control lost contact with a twin OTA aircraft operated by Nepali carrier Tara Air shortly after taking off from Pokhara in western Nepal on Sunday morning headed for Jomson, a popular trekking destination. Helicopters operated by the military and private firms braved poor weather to square the remote mountainous area all day Sunday aided by teams on foot but called off the fruitless search when night fell. After resuming on Monday, the Army shared on social media a photo of aircraft parts and other debris littering a sheer mountainside, including a wing with a registration number 9NAET, clearly visible. Around 100 people have died in clashes between gold miners in northern Chad, Defense Minister General Daoud Yahya Ibrahim said on Monday. Violence broke out on May 23rd at Kuri Bugudi, near the Libyan border, sparked by a mundane dispute between two people, which degenerated. He added that the toll was around 100 dead and at least 40 wounded. The clashes occurred in the rugged Tibesti Mountains in the central Sahara, some 1,000 kilometers from the Chadian capital in Jamina. The discovery of gold there has sparked a rush of miners from across Chad and neighboring countries and tensions often run high. This is Trust TV News Hour. We'll be back after the break.
Thank you for rejoining us. We now go to sports. Novak Djokovic renews his epic 16-year rivalry with Rafael Nadal at the French Open on Tuesday with a semi-final spot at stake. Victory could end the 13-time champion's Roland Garros career. Nadal, who will turn 36 on Friday, puts his record of 109 wins and just three losses in Paris since his title-winning debut in 2005 on the line against the defending champion. The Spaniard was taken to five sets for only the third time in his tournament history by 21-year-old Felix Olga Aliasim in the fourth round. In the immediate aftermath of that victory, Nadal admitted that not only was this year's French Open at stake for him, but possibly his entire playing future. Action continues in the ongoing handball Premier League at Indoor Sports Hall of MKO Abiola Stadium, where male and female teams are competing in the first phase of a handball league. Trust TV Adeni Adishafe has more. Match day eight handball game between former champions Niger United and Toja Marine of Lagos ended in 29-23 in favor of Niger State handball team, Niger United, who showed experience against the young side of Toja Marine. The first half saw the two teams showing flashes of point score as a spike off in the keenly contested game, where the two goalkeepers, Mukaila Fuad of Toja Marine and Abbas Mohamed of Niger United, blocked most of the chances. Niger United coach Yekini Adebayo says experience really counts for his team against young and energetic side of Tugay Marine. It's only experience that my team be able to contain them and subdue them. That is it. it was experience. experience. You can see their match yesterday against uh, Sokoto because Sokoto boys too, they are young, they are fit, so they've exhausted most of their fitness, their energy yesterday. And today I, I was impressed. They still came out very strong, but the experience now counts. I have to contain them. The, the, my own players need to play to instruction, they play to the bench. And that was what uh, brought it, uh, gave the results. Why to Marine coach Bright Agubata could not really explain what went wrong with his youthful team, despite giving Niger United a good run in the game, as he also mentioned fatigue as another disadvantage to his team performance. I don't know what really happened because my team, my boys, they had a lot of turnovers. Like in the second half, I had up to nine, seven meters, nine penalty they missed. So I don't really know why it should be like that. So. There are players that are growing up. But when you're playing a big team like this, you know, if you're, if you're doing your own strategies, there will be countering. Prudence Energy Handball League Phase 1 continues as male and female teams fight for points in the competition. That's Sport News. I am Adeni Ajishafe. And on a lighter note, an overheard conversation on an aeroplane changed Brighton Zambezi's life. The former technician is now one of Zimbabwe's pioneering black soldier fly BSF maggot farmers, rearing the flies to produce affordable chicken feed for farmers. Take a look. <laughs> Basic farming, it is uh, the, f uh, the farming of flies, the black soldier fly. Uh, I started basic farming in 2018 by researching. Uh, it took me the, the whole year researching uh, basic farming. Then in 2019, I started uh, basic farming. Usually they uh, love to hide their eggs. This is a very, very sensitive uh, insect. It's a very, very insect, uh, sensitive insect. So they lay eggs in the, the cardboard boxes. So from this side we come to the growing area when we leave our tray uh, with eggs we will leave it for four to five days uh, to hatch uh, after hatching we will come to see things like this this is what we call bsf mangoes Besides teaching people about basic farming, I also sell chicks. Uh, I also send seed to Botswana. As, as, uh, as far as Botswana, uh, Mozambique, and, uh, and South Africa. My flies are under my name From se seven days, going up, uh, it will be ready to feed our animals, either our chickens, 
or our pigs or anything that we need to feed. All right. This is a free feed. Come and join and uh, make your own feed at no cost. Only labor you need on base of farming. And this is protein, 4% and, uh, and above of protein content. Insect is a, is a, is a future uh, for our food security. I think we all know uh, through our climate changes and what's happening to the world. I think insects and animals are the future. Who would have thought from an airplane convo conversation now to profits? And with that, we have come to the end of News Hour on Trust TV tonight. For more news, connect with us across all our social media platforms. I am Eugenia Abu. We thank you for watching. <laughs>